Bruce Goose, the Titanic of airplanes, the largest and most powerful airplane of its time. Welcome to the Spruce Goose H4 Hercules documentary. In this video, we will discuss and experience the sheer awe of one of Howard Hughes' greatest creations, the Spruce Goose. It's hard not to feel so small when you are in the presence of something as gargantuan as the Spruce Goose. With a vast history and so many other topics to discuss from its creator, Howard Hughes, to the materials it was constructed from. The Spruce Goose was a plane that during World War II it cost $23 million to build. Meant for better means of transporting troops and equipment overseas, not to mention one man's obsession and the fact that it was made entirely from wood. But let's just start here for now. I've put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back. And I mean it. He said, we're going to fly. Set the flaps at about 15%. Those are the things on the end of the wings, OK? 15%, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 90 knots. It's about 95 miles an hour. He's airborne, all right? Less than a minute, less than a mile. It never flew again. Didn't belong to Howard. So he, uh, he went ahead, came back to the dock, and they looked, what were you thinking? What were you doing? Howard, well, it just got away from me. I'm sorry. I can't help it. It's what the airplane did. He did that, ladies, to prove that he had his reputation on the line. He had to prove that it would fly and it would work. But it never flew again. It belonged to the government. Howard bought it back for $800,000, had hermetically sealed them, it's all pressurized and nothing, no wind or weather can bother it, and put it in a um, big dome, 33 years at the tune of a million bucks a year, but 33 years. Howard died in 1976. General Motors bought the company, broke it up. And the Aero Club of Southern California came along, a lot of power, juice, and money means they were big time guys, okay? Nobody's going to cut on this. So they put this out for bid from all these companies. Pratt & Whitney won the engine, Smithsonian wanted the cockpit. They're going to cut it up. They're going to slice it up like the salami. And the Aero Club case, nobody's going to cut on it. But Leslie, Mr. Smith, got this for a dollar. So he bought it. He bought it for a dollar. It cost him over $7 million to get it up here. Because of wartime restrictions on steel, Hughes decided to build his aircraft out of wood, laminated with plastic and covered with fabric. Although it was constructed mainly of birch, the use of spruce alongside with its white gray color would later earn the aircraft the nickname Spruce Goose. On a side note, explained to me by a United States Air Force veteran, you'll see beach balls right here in the Spruce Goose. They were placed right underneath the wing for buoyancy because without them, it leaked. That way it could land on the water and float. She tells a story of sacrifice, determination. The 
The creation of the Hughes flying boat involved many types of engineering. Not only did mechanical engineers participate in the numerous aspects of the aircraft project, but their efforts ranged from the models constructed for wind tunnel evaluation and towing basin tests through the final launching details of the completed seaplane. Mechanical engineering was involved in designing many elements of the flying boat. The jigs and fixtures for molding the aircraft parts, the fire suppression system, multiple hydraulic components such as flareless tubing fittings and slip joints, the fuel and oil tanks, the pumps and piping for the fuel and oil supplies, the oil cooling system, and the cockpit instrumentation, not to mention the design of the massive engines and full feathering propellers with reverse capability. Because this is a prototype, and that was in short supply during the war, and it happened in 39 years now. So this is all good. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. But it actually did fly, right? Pretty much, yeah. It's not a real flight, but it's about a mile, about a minute. Yeah. Crazy. This wingspan is 320 feet, tip to tip. We put this on a football field and build a new school. That's so crazy. It is massive. Yeah. It's a trip. Thank you. Sure. 400,000 pound plane. Designed to carry fuel and passengers or whatever. But when he flew it that one minute, it was pretty light. He had three people in the air and something else. When we look right here, we can see some of the first test strips of the wood used. What you are looking at is birch wood. And in your day, a caravan of pieces stretched more than 1,500 feet down the narrow road. The flying boat arrived at McMinnville at Evergreen International Aviation on February 27, 1993. A Spruce Goose Homecoming Parade converged down the final mile on the 138 day. In 1993, people lined the streets to see the Goose's parts be transported to their new home in McMinnville. People of all ages, backgrounds, and genders were elated to see the world's largest wooden airplane. It was a unifying project from the beginning as a symbol of wartime sacrifice, determination, and technological advancement. In its construction, it brought together material experts, electrical engineers, and mechanical engineers to make the plane flyable. During its 30 years of development and storage, aviator Howard Hughes's plane was flyable at a moment's notice. In its final journey to Oregon, movers, mariners, and local government worked together to bring the plane to its final resting place. The Spruce Goose has gone by many names in its life, but whether it is referred to as the Hercules, the Hughes Flying Boat, or the Spruce Goose, our wooden airplane continues to be a symbol of bringing communities together. It took 
eight years to reassemble the spruce goose where it lays today. Fuselage entered the hangar on September the 22nd and was lowered into a seven-foot pit a week later. Reassembly of the wings occurred on November 15th, followed by the vertical tail on November 20th. The pylons were assembled on January 25th, 2001, and crews attached the eight Pratt Whitney R4360 engines to the flying boat on February 23rd. Volunteers applied new fabric to the ailerons and began restoration of the flaps and horizontal stabilizers during the spring. They painted and prepared the propellers attaching them to the aircraft in early May. This was followed by assembly of the horizontal stabilizers on May 25th, just in time for the new facility's opening on June 6, 2001. After a busy summer, crews began assembling the flying boat's control surfaces. The flaps were assembled September 6th the ailerons on October 9, and the rudder and elevators were attached in early December. On December 7, the 60th anniversary of attack on Pearl Harbor, crews assembled the final piece, the tail cone. After a ribbon-cutting ceremony signifying the completion of the flying boat's incredible journey. Now commonly called the Spruce Goose, the Hughes Flying Boat has endured many hardships to become a popular and important cultural artifact. The flying boat's size and lift capacity have shaped technology and revolutionized modern flight. She is still the largest wooden seaplane ever built and now rests amongst other historical aircraft at the Evergreen Aviation Museum in McMinnville, Oregon. She tells the story of sacrifice, determination, and technological developments that embody the pioneering spirit of great aviators like Howard Hughes. Her legacy is a story of a nation's desire to protect freedom at a time of great peril, a rise to the challenge by great and common Americans, and a continuing dedication to our nation's dream to fly. This carburetor was overhauled for Hughes's Aircraft Corporation in 1955 and was then sealed in a storage can. The engine type Pratt and Whitley R4360 WASP Major Strumber PR100 series is a pressure injected carburetor. This model carburetor was installed on 28-cylinder Pratt & Whitley R4360 aircraft engine producing 3,000 to 3,500 horsepower each. That is seven four-cylinder engines per engine and there are eight engines in total. These engines powered many airplanes. H4 flying boat, also the XF11, as well as the F2G Corsair, the B377, the B50, the SLKC97, the C99, early C119, C124, the YB35, the B36, and a few others. The wingspan is 320 feet and 0 inches. The last flight was on November the 2nd, 1947. 
The top speed is 235 miles an hour. But keep in mind, this plane has a weight of 300,000 pounds at takeoff. The aircraft would weigh around 400,000 pounds, including fuel and human weight. At full capacity, the Spruce Goose could carry up to 400 troops. What you are listening to now is the only sound recorded of the Spruce Goose. What you are currently looking at here are pictures from the factory in Culver City, California of where the Spruce Goose was constructed. This was back in 1944. Right here is what you are seeing is a scale model of the Spruce Goose. It was made as a movie set for the movie The Aviator. The Spruce Goose was more than just a technological marvel. It was a lightning rod for attention in the 1940s and continues to show its roots in our cultural narrative today. Just in the 21st century, there have been numerous references in film and television. In 2004, the film Aviator was directed by renowned filmmaker Martin Scorsese and starred Leonardo DiCaprio along with a star-studded cast to document the early career of Howard Hughes's climbing in the flight of the Hughes flying boat. In 2005, the television show The Simpsons parried the story of the Spruce Goose with, quote, the plywood pelican, end quote. In 2009, the children's show Phineas and Ferb followed the show's characters on an adventure to build a paper mache spruce goose. 
The television show Leverage in 2013 even takes place at this museum and follows the team as they plan to trick a corrupt airline CEO into stealing the Spruce Goose. Furthermore, in December of 2022, Microsoft visited the museum in Oregon to visit the Spruce Goose and bring it back to life in a game called Flight Simulator. As you can see, the Spruce Goose flying here, flying high once again. Maybe not in this world, but in many others to come. That's for sure. As time progresses into the future, there will be more and more people who become curious about the Spruce Goose and will, in some way or form, bring it back to life, whether in their mind, in a video game, or who knows, maybe in the future, there will be a modern type of Spruce Goose. Who's to say? But as for now, the Spruce Goose sits in a hangar in a museum in McMinnville, Oregon. I hope you enjoyed watching this documentary. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I would like to thank all my sponsors. The Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum, Nine and Many, myself, Critical Past for some of the film, and The Wolf Fam. And of course, a very special thank you to Mr. Howard Hughes.